Welcome to my Shalom Zone. My name is Sherry Dawn, and it's my great honor and privilege to get to share this Grace Encounter with you today. One of the reasons that I teach on the grace of God and talk about the grace of God so much is to keep it fresh in your thinking and in my thinking. We were born into a cosmic war that has been going on for centuries, and when we were born again, we joined the wind inside, but the war did not go away. I can't change that. I wish I could, but I can't. It is a reality of where we are right now. And we have to we have to wake up to the truth of that and be willing in our minds to deal with it. The new birth gave us a new identity and it gave us better weapons. It gave us angels to help us. But it takes the renewing of our minds in the Word of God to equip us and teach us how to use what we have been given. And every minister does not have the same assignment. We do have the responsibility to do our part, our calling, to share the things that the Lord shows us with other people so that they can be better equipped. And I, I can't do somebody else's, but I have to do mine. And I know what the Lord has laid on my heart to share with people, to equip them, to have them help them have confidence in the blood of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, and in what he did for us, uh, what he and the Father agreed together to do to rescue us and to minister such amazing grace to us because everything we need to receive in order to be able not only to survive these times, but to thrive in these times, it's going to come to us through the favor of God, the grace of God. And if, if there's any shred of an idea in our minds that we've got to somehow earn or deserve God's help on any situation, any topic, then we're going to fall short of receiving that help because we're trying to get it the wrong way. And we've, we've got to understand this. I pray and ask the Lord to open our understanding so many times, and I'm going to keep praying that way. But I'm not going to quit talking about grace. It, keeping the grace and the righteousness of God as a gift by faith in it, uppermost in our thinkings, it doesn't mean that we're a, avoiding the hard issues that are in the world. Nor, nor does it mean that we're trying to escape the war. No, this is helping us find a place to stand to deal more effectively with the issues that we face and with the war that's going on. It means we are deliberately choosing to focus on the finished work of Jesus and draw from that as our ammunition source. It means that we're choosing to flow in agreement with heaven and with God's purpose and plans for our generation. And we can't get revelation on that as long as we're striving and straining and basing everything that we receive from the Lord on the strength of our perfect obedience or our lack of obedience. Because when we fail to obey, and we all do, then if we don't know how to receive based on the grace of God and the fact that we've been made righteous as a gift, then condemnation is going to sneak in. It's going to take hold. And when the condemnation takes hold, it enters in and it chokes the word. And the word becomes ineffective in our lives. Well, we can't afford that. So we have to stand forever in the truth that there is no condemnation to us in Christ Jesus. And we're no longer in the flesh if we're born of the Spirit, according to verse 9 of that same chapter. We've got to choose to embrace this truth by faith and stand in this and use it because we're, we are in critical times. And playing church is not going to cut it. I'm sorry. It's just not. 
trying to mix law and grace is not going to cut it. We have got to know what our covenant says. God's people are not destroyed for lack of power. They're destroyed for lack of knowledge. They're not destroyed for lack of incentive. They're destroyed for lack of knowledge. We've got to understand what this covenant has provided for us and be willing to receive it by faith and move forward because of that. Now, with all of that said, let us look at Psalm 89. Psalm 89, verses 1 and 2. Now, this is uh, Ethan the Ezraite. And he, he had the same anointing by the Holy Spirit on him when he was sitting down to write this because there are several verses in this particular psalm about King David, but they also are referring to Christ in the future. So we, we have to pay attention to these because there are nuggets in these that apply to new covenant people. Psalm 89, verses 1 and 2. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. So I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. Mercies is from that Hebrew word chesed, and it means the kindness, the beauty, the favor, the goodness, the loving kindness, the mercy, and the pity of the Lord. I apologize for that. It seems like no matter what time I decide to take one of these, we're going to have a train come through. So, um, grace, grace. <laughs> I want you to notice that he is making a specific decision and saying, with my mouth, I will make known thy faithfulness. We are called to testify of God's faithfulness to every generation. His faithfulness to his word does not fail because of COVID or because of what's happening in Afghanistan. His faithfulness is in context with his chesed, mercy, favor, grace. And I want you to notice this because it's a pattern that repeats itself. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. The thing about getting grounded in the grace of God is that no matter how rotten you may feel, no matter how black things may look, when you start thinking about the goodness and the grace of God, praise is the automatic response. You cannot stay down in your thinking because you realize I've got so much to be thankful for. Well, when you choose to start expressing that thanksgiving and giving praise unto the Lord, it lightens the atmosphere around you because demons cannot stay around to oppress somebody that is choosing to praise the Lord because praise is toxic to them. So this guy had learned something. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever with my mouth. I'm not waiting on somebody else's mouth to do this. With my mouth, I will make known thy faithfulness to all generations. For I have said Mercy shall be built up forever. And again, mercy, it is the chesed. It's not going away. Grace is not going away. I have said this mercy, chesed, mercy, grace, shall be built up forever. Thy faithfulness shalt thou establish in the very heavens. So again, we have the faithfulness of God connected to his chesed, mercy, grace, favor. No accident. This is on purpose. This is deliberate. The Holy Spirit is wanting us to understand something here. Establish is from the Hebrew word kun, and it means to be erect. That means to set up, to confirm, to direct, or to establish. Now, why would God have to set up, establish his faithfulness in the very heavens? If, if there's something's going on that has hindered his faithfulness in regard to his chesed, favor, mercy, grace, then we've got to understand this. And as I've shared with you before, Hebrews chapter 12 is prophetic of the last days. It refers to a prophecy written hundreds of years before that says that I will not only shake the earth, but I will shake the heavens also. 
signifying the removing of those things that are shaken. So this is where we are. God is shaking the earth and the heavens to remove those things that can be shaken. Well, those some of those things that can be shaken are the evil principalities and powers and dominions and the wicked spirits in the heavenly places. So this is not talking about heaven where the new Jerusalem is. This is talking about heaven as in the air that we breathe, the atmospheric envelope around this planet, as well as the dimension above that called the second heaven where the demonic principalities and powers are, whatever. So in heavens, from the Hebrew word shama, and it means to be lofty. It means the sky, the air, the heavens. The scripture talks about the prince of the power of the air. So this man has got a revelation from God as he's writing down that God is going to establish his faithfulness into the very heavens. And he said, mercy shall be built up forever. The said mercy, grace, it's going to be built up forever. It's not going to diminish. It's not going away. It's part of what the kingdom of God is. It's what the new covenant is all about. It's going to continue to be built up forever. And if that distresses you, then I would encourage you to get on your face before the Lord and ask him to help you to deal with the truths of the new covenant regarding mercy and grace, no matter what it does to your religion. I had to do that. Other people are having to do that. We're having to choose to let go of things that have hindered us and held us back and totally embrace the gospel of grace. In that first and second heaven, the air is infested with demons. And those demons love to play mind games. They love to oppress people. And they love to think that they've got the upper hand and they love to try to convince people that they've got the upper hand. But they don't. Their head was judged at the cross. He is now on his way to the pit. And he's trying to take everybody with him that he possibly can. But for the people who understand the covenant of grace and the people who are declaring the faithfulness of God, regardless of what they see or what they hear or how they feel, he cannot manipulate those people. And that upsets him somewhat. And that's the reason for all of these things that are happening in the earth. You've got to learn to interpret them as what they really are. He is hysterical with fear and with anger because he knows his jig is up. So he is trying his best through famine, through plagues, through war, through oppression, through persecution, through destruction on every hand to distract the church and make her forget who she is and what grace has provided and make her shut her mouth and quit declaring the faithfulness of God. Because as she declares the faithfulness of God, faithfully, guess what happens? That faithfulness regarding that mercy grace, it begins to be manifest in the atmosphere. It begins to be manifest in the earth. It begins to change everything. Because where grace abounds or where sin abounded, grace does much more abound. And wherever the enemy has been trying to operate, whenever people are, are calling upon the faithfulness of God and the grace of God, that hinders his ability because the scripture tells us that sin shall have no dominion because we're not under the law, we're under grace. Well, God is teaching us how to operate in the flow of that and how to help get that established here in the earth because he's determined it's going to be established in the earth and in the heavens. Let's look on down uh, to Psalm 89, 14. At through verses 18. This is a good psalm, but as I said, it's prophetic of David, but there's some things in here that uh, regard the Lord Jesus Christ and that also are, are applicable to the New Covenant Church. Psalm 89, verse 14, he said, Justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Now, every time I read throne, I try to remind myself of the scripture in the book of Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16 where the scripture tells us to come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need so justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne mercy and truth shall go before thy face and again mercy is from that hebrew word said kindness beauty goodness favor loving kindness mercy so forth I've shared with you all uh, many, many months of uh, 2020 
about the fact that we're living in the third day in which the book of Hosea chapter 6 tells us that God will revive us and raise us up and cause us to live in his sight. I spent weeks pointing out the fact that that word sight means his face, his presence. It's from the Hebrew word panim. It means his presence or his face. It's interpreted as face or translated as face many times in the scriptures. So when it's telling us here that mercy and truth go before his face, that grace, the said mercy grace, goes before his face, we need to understand. We cannot approach God. We cannot stand in his presence or live in his presence, his face, without encountering the said favor, mercy, grace. Okay? If we're going to try to do it some other way, we're not going to connect. We've got to come on the strength of his grace because he is determined to be the giver and we're supposed to be the receivers. He said, blessed is the people that know the joyful sound. They shall walk, O Lord, in the light of thy countenance. See, he, he is light. And where his face is, where his presence is, there's going to be light. Well, demons are allergic to light because they're of the darkness. They can't hang around there. So we want to cultivate his presence. That word sound is from the Hebrew word teruah, and it means an acclamation of joy, and it's in reference to the Jubilee. Now, if you're familiar with the scriptures under the Old Covenant, the Lord had a system set up so that every seven years there was a Jubilee proclaimed or a release where people were released from their debts. and But on the, the 50th year, which was... Seven sevens would have been, you know, 49. And the 50th year, it was a year of jubilee to where massive debts were forgiven. Properties were returned. People that had to sell themselves and their families into slavery in order to pay debts were released. It was all pictures pointing toward Jesus as our jubilee. That he would pay our debt our sin debt, and that we would be freed and that things that we had lost would be restored unto us. So this joyful sound here is the joyful uh, hooting and hollering and carrying on you know, the praise, the worship. It, it means a clamorous sound. It's all about the frequency of grace, frequency of God's unearned, undeserved, unmerited favor that's given to us because of what Jesus did at the cross. And it has to be received on the strength of what Jesus did at the cross. Our worship and our praise going up. Blessed is the people that knows that joyful sound. Blessed is the people that's tuned in to that frequency of grace. They're not moved by anything less than because grace is higher. It's the higher ways of God. Blessed are those people. In thy name shall they rejoice all the day, and in thy righteousness shall they be exalted. Now, thy righteousness, not ours. See, under the law, we were righteous if we could keep it. Well, nobody could keep it all. We might could do most of the external things, but the internal stuff, we, we couldn't. That's the reason we needed a Savior. His righteousness was given to us as a gift, Romans 5, 17. So we've got to understand this is talking primarily to new covenant people. In thy name they shall rejoice all the day, and in thy righteousness they shall be exalted. In his righteousness, acknowledging that we've been made righteous as a gift, and because he is our righteousness, no weapon formed against us shall prosper. Okay? Exalted is from the Hebrew word room, and it means to be high, it means to be raised up, to mount up, or to be promoted. When you make it your mission in life to understand what it means that you've been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus and that it's a gift, that there's no way you can ever earn it or deserve it, and you make it a point to become conscious of that and to begin to declare that the first thing every morning when your eyes pop open, that you start praising the God that you've been made righteous by the blood of Jesus. And that that righteousness is a gift. And that Jehovah said canoe, which means the Lord our righteousness. The scripture says that in him we have righteousness and strength. 
and you start your day out focusing on the fact I have been made righteous as a gift there is no condemnation to me in Christ Jesus yesterday's gone and done I've got a fresh day fresh slate and I am a king and a priest by the blood of Jesus glory to God I'm looking for something good to happen today when you start living that way you find yourself being raised up over things that you used to not be able to overcome. You find yourself being promoted when you know good and well you could not have earned or deserved that promotion no matter how hard you worked. You find yourself being shown favor in different situations and it's not because you're all that, but it's because you are acknowledging that Jesus is your righteousness. It's in his righteousness that we're exalted, raised up. We, I mean, my goodness, we've been raised up and seated together with him in heavenly places right beside the heavenly father just because we received him as our savior. There are so many blessings and things that are available to us and that are true for us that we've been ignorant of because religion has blinded us. God is asking us to wake up to these truths of what it means to be the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So when you start rejoicing in that, and every time you think of it all day long, you just have a little, thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you so much that you're my righteousness. Thank you that I can't earn or deserve your favor. Thank you that your strength is made perfect in my weakness. Glory to God. And you're just doing that all day long under your breath. You find yourself being exalted and raised up. For thou art the glory of thy strength, of their strength, and in thy favor our horn shall be exalted. Mm. Favor is from the Hebrew word ratzon, and it means delight, acceptance, favor, good pleasure. This is the reason that I harp on that scripture in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 6, that you are accepted in the beloved. You're not accepted because you do everything right. You are accepted in the beloved. And to be accepted in the beloved means that you have been with the Father's favor, permission, and delight. You've been seated at His right hand in Christ Jesus. You have permission to sit in His presence. You're accepted. No matter who may reject you here on this earth, God is not rejecting you. You are accepted in the beloved. So he's the glory of your strength and in his favor, in his acceptance of you, your horn shall be exalted. Now horn is simply a symbolic term for power and the authority to govern. God's raising you up as a king and a priest to govern, to declare things and have them come to pass, to have all heaven ready to back up what you say because you're flowing in the river of righteousness and you're operating on the frequency of grace and you're letting everything else fall by the wayside. Verse 18, for the Lord is our defense and the Holy One of Israel is our King. All of these things happen, four equals because. Because He's our defense. He's our King. The same Lord of whom it is written and testified that his mercy and truth goes before his face. He is our defense. So when the scripture tells us in the book of Ephesians that it's by grace we're saved through faith and that not of ourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And I've shared with you over and over and over, and I'm going to keep harping on it. Saved is from that Greek word sozo. That means saved, healed, delivered, rescued, protected, preserved, and made whole. It's by His grace, His unmerited, unearned, undeserved favor, or the chesed, mercy, grace, favor, kindness, goodness, all of that. It just, you tie it all up in a big package and wrap a red bow around it and just call it grace or just call it favor because sometimes grace just becomes another one of those religious words to us. But the favor, the acceptance of God, His willingness to move and to minister on your behalf, not because of what you deserve, but because of what Jesus deserves. Whew. Just because you're in Jesus. We have to bring it down to that one point. And that's where we make our stand. And that's where we refuse to budge. It has to be because of what Jesus did. Nothing more. 
nothing less. The scripture tells us in the book of Daniel that those that do know their God in the last days shall be strong and do exploits. We have to have more than head knowledge. It's a knowing on the inside because of intimate reaction and interaction with him through praise and worship, through revelation of his word, to the receiving the Holy Communion through the body and the blood of the Lord. He operates on the frequency of grace. And he told us to come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now, we need abundance of grace to face the challenges of the last days. We need grace to face plagues. We need grace to face persecution. We need grace to face political betrayal. We need grace to face panic. And we need grace to face the powerlessness that we're seeing evidenced in the body of Christ because trying to mix law and grace has made Christ ineffective in us. And for those of us that are learning about grace and trying to be faithful to receive the grace and move forward, there's a very, very big temptation to be completely overwhelmed and discouraged because there are still so many who are insisting on mixing law and grace. And knowing that that's hindering things, you know, kind of makes us want to get violent. <laughs> you can't get violent physically. You can't despise people. You can't hate people. We have to love and forgive and move past that and continue to receive grace for those that are not yet receiving grace. You want to crucify your flesh? <laughs> Start pursuing the grace of God. Start deliberately receiving the grace of God because you're going to get plenty of opportunities. So many people are, are struggling right now. And in light of everything, you know, that's going on uh, and becoming very evident in Afghanistan and the, and the persecution that's just becoming out in the open as, as Christians are being slaughtered because of their faith in Christ. And, you know, the, the, the circus in our government and COVID and just, and, you know, and then just, just, just stuff, just every day, just stuff on top of stuff. And they're thinking, you know, what, what are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? <laughs> I've, ha I've been asked, I I've lost count now of how many times I've been asked by different people, do you think this COVID vaccine is the mark of the beast? People are confused. They, they don't know what to do. So I just want to encourage you. You keep looking at the grace of God. You keep receiving the grace of God. If you know and have received your prayer language and can pray in the Holy Ghost, praying in tongues, I would advise you to pray a lot in tongues because according to the scriptures, and I may do a teaching on this soon, but according to the scriptures, when you're praying in tongues, you are praying out the mysteries. If you don't know what's going to happen in the future, but you're needing help, you can pray that out just by praying in tongues. The scripture tells us that when we pray in tongues, that's when we're entering into the rest and we're getting the refreshing in the presence of the Lord. The scripture also tells us that when we pray in tongues, we're praying the perfect will of God. When we pray in tongues, we're building up our most holy faith. When we pray in tongues, the, we're being established in the love of God. We're edifying our, ourselves. We're keeping ourselves in the love. There's just so many benefits that happen just by doing that one spiritual communion and exercise heart to heart. The scripture says when you're praying in tongues, your spirit is praying. People under the old covenant couldn't do that. This is a new covenant thing. Your spirit directly communing with God's spirit and because it bypasses your understanding, you don't have any opportunity to doubt what you've been praying and asking for because it's coming straight out of your spirit where Jesus has been made one spirit with you. He's the author and finisher of faith. Doubt's not going to interfere with it. It's a powerful thing and that's the reason Satan hates it and that's the reason he fights it so hard. 
But if you have received your prayer language, I would invite you or encourage you, pray in tongues. If you've not yet received your prayer language, begin to give thanks for the blood of Jesus and uh, declare that blood of Jesus over your life and tell the Lord, I want to receive my prayer language. I want to be able to pray out the mysteries. I, I don't know how to pray here. I don't know how to pray according to your will here, but he prays according to your will. He makes intercession for me. I need someone praying for me. Encourage you to do that. I would also encourage you to turn off your electronics and spend some time reading in the book of Romans and in the book of Ephesians. Don't go straight to the book of Revelation and just get scared plumb out of your mind. If you don't have a foundation in grace and you try to read Revelation, it looks like nothing but bad news. But if you understand that God is raising up his kingdom right under the devil's nose in these last days and that he is taking steps and everything he's moving the body of Christ into is to fulfill the declaration in the book of Revelation that the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our Lord, then you can read Revelation and it's not that big a problem. But until you get established in the fact that God loves you so much, He gave His Son to die in your place, to suffer your punishment, to be made sin with your sin, to carry your sickness and your disease, you have no business trying to get you know, involved in prophecy. Get established in the love of God. Get established in the fact that everything you're going to receive from Him is going to be because of His willingness, His heart, His yearning to minister that unearned, undeserved, unmerited favor, a.k.a. grace, to you. No matter how bad you've been, no matter what you've done, no matter what your past is, God's not near as concerned about your past as He is your future. And when you're in Him, your future's good. But that doesn't mean there's not going to be some things that we're going to have to walk through down here. And we need grace to face it. And if you won't even commune with him on the wavelength of grace, you are hurting yourself. You're hurting your family. That's got to change. And I just want to encourage you. Talk to the Lord about receiving his wisdom and his grace. Ask him for wisdom. Ask him for grace. Ask him for the power to be manifest in your life. Quit waiting on it to happen to somebody else. Be willing for it to happen to you. Let me bless you. The Lord bless you and grant you grace to face whatever is seeking to devour your faith and your hope. The Lord quicken you with fresh fire, fresh vision, and fresh purpose. The Lord bless your bread and your water. The Lord cause you to prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you, beloved kings and priests of the Most High God. I hope you said amen. Let us pray. Father, if not for your grace, we would have absolutely no place to stand. To commune with you, we would have no hope of supernatural intervention. It would be easy to be overcome by all the darkness that we see manifesting in the earth. But we're not without your grace. The scripture tells us that the law came by Moses, or the law was given by Moses, through Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. The law was on tables of stone, but Jesus is a warm, living person, the very heartbeat of God. You sent him to help us understand how you think and how you operate and what your heart is. And Father, I pray for everybody that hears these broadcasts and I send these words out on the wavelength of the Spirit for the people who don't hear this broadcast. But I'm asking for your grace to be manifest in ministering wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of God. I'm asking for your grace to be manifest to baptize with the Holy Spirit, Lord, and to release people into their prayer language, that the gifts of the Spirit may be stirred up in the body of Christ, that we may step into our destinies 
that you've ordained for us for this time. I want to thank you, Lord, because you're not the least bit dismayed by what's happening in the earth. I know it breaks your heart because the blood of your saints is precious to you. The scripture tells us that. And Father, on behalf of all of those that are suffering and losing their lives, and for your sake, let every drop of blood that is shed further the kingdom. Let it bring more of your power into that area. Raise up intercessors, Lord, that will listen to the Holy Spirit and take authority over the demonic principalities and powers that have had such a grip on the minds of those people in that region. Shake them loose, Lord. Shake them loose. As you shake the heavens and the earth, we apply the blood of Jesus. And we thank you that Jesus is our high priest. It has been written of you that you will sprinkle many nations and the kings shall shut their mouths at you and that which have not been told them, they will see. That which they've not heard, they will consider. We're asking for revival fire because of the blood of Jesus to be poured out in Afghanistan. We ask you to strengthen and comfort your people, Lord. And when it comes time for them to offer their lives, help them to do it as an offering and let not the enemy take it from them. Thank you that death has lost its sting and the grave has lost its victory. Thank you, Father, for grace upon them. We receive your mercy and your grace, and we ask you to awaken the church here in these Western Hemisphere, because so many of us have been so complacent, we've been so content and just happy to be, you know, soft and warm and sheltered. Touch our hearts. Awaken us. Kindle us. Kindle the love of God in us and deliver us from the complacency and the hard-heartedness, the deceptions that we've lived in these many years. Thank you for what you're doing. I know you're pouring out your Holy Spirit on all flesh. I know that this great awakening is already started. And I just give you praise for it. And I trust, I trust, Father, that you are reaching out to your people and they are responding. To all glory and dominion be unto you, and I give you thanks that you are with us as a mighty, terrible one. Therefore, our persecutors shall stumble and they shall not prevail. They shall be greatly ashamed and they shall not prosper. Their everlasting confusion shall never be forgotten. Because you are Jehovah Sid Canoe, the Lord our righteousness. Amen. All right, dear friend. I will talk to you later. I hope you have an absolutely fabulous day.